Over 500,000 children experience life in an orphanage, foster home or institution during the last century in Australia. 7,000 were child migrants from Britain or Malta. 50,000 were Aboriginal, the stolen generation. The rest, over 400,000, were Australian-born, non-Indigenous children. These survivors of the institutional care system are the forgotten Australians. You weren't treated like human beings, you were just treated like a number. It should never have happened to be taken away from your family and put in care 12,000 miles away in itself is a criminal act. I did grow up thinking that, you know, who would want me? Most of these children didn't understand why they were there. Some had a parent who died or became very ill. With no pension for single parents, the children were placed in state care. Children were also put into care if parents were considered unfit by the state. Imagine if this was your child. Imagine. I draw attention to the fact that 88% of children who were institutionalised in Australia in the 20th century were Australian-born non-Indigenous children. And one of the reasons that I do this is because I have a personal connection to this living history. I think I was about three, my mother sat me down and it was a really important conversation. I remember it because it was very serious. She said that there was a very special visitor that was coming to stay that weekend and it was very important that I share my toys with her. So the weekend came and the very special visitor arrived and I remember her sitting opposite me at the dining room table. She was about my age or perhaps older and she was very quiet. She didn't seem very special because she didn't have anything to say. And I couldn't understand why my mother went to so much trouble in cooking the meal. There was so much food on the table and it wasn't even Christmas. My dad worked in a factory and he was a committed member of his trade union and he was really passionate about the idea of a fair go and he was a loving father. But sometimes when he talked about revolutions that had happened in the past or a pertinent current event, he'd bash the table with his fist such that the cutlery would fly in the air. And of course, what I was learning from him was the importance in speaking up for the rights of others. And my mother at the Mother's Union at the local church heard that there were children from orphanages that needed somewhere to stay at a weekend or during school holidays. My parents weren't very well off but they believed in the notion that the idea of the community was more important than the idea of the individual. So, of course, they said yes to having a child stay. Barbara didn't grow up, or she wasn't living in a house with a family. Barbara lived at St Mary's home in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. And this is me with Barbara. I'm in the middle. Dad's not playing favourites. He's just trying to hold me still for the camera. St Mary's was a foundling home, which meant that when the children grew up old enough to go to school, they were taken to another institution. And that's how we lost touch with Barbara. So another special visitor came to stay, Mary. And that's me with Mary in our backyard. I'm the tall one on the right. It was really sad on a Sunday to have to take Barbara and then Mary back to the institution. But what really broke my heart was learning much later as an adult what really went on in over 800 institutions throughout Australia. You see, we were only one family of hundreds of families in Australia that hosted children from institutions on the weekends and school holidays. 
We knew, we all knew, we always knew. So then how as a nation did we come to forget? How did children like Barbara and Mary end up being known as the forgotten Australians? You see, it's highly likely that either you are or you, are, or you know someone or are related to or work with or live someone who experienced out-of-home care or in an institution in the 20th century. In fact, researchers have argued that Australia has the highest rate of institutionalisation of children of any country in the world. So how as a nation do we respond to this? Well, there are national and local organisations that advocate and support forgotten Australians and care leavers. And in November 2009, the Australian government issued a national apology to the forgotten Australians and former child migrants. This was a different apology to the Stolen Generation. The Stolen Generation apology was in 2008. This apology was in 2009. Why a separate apology to non-Indigenous Australians? Why did the Australian government need to say sorry? This is Tom. Tom didn't get a picture of himself, he's middle-aged now, until four years ago, this photo. He grew up never having a photo of himself as a child. He received this photo from the academic couple with whom he used to stay during weekends and holidays when he was a child. Tom now has three university degrees and works as an engineer. But at the age of one, Tom was taken to a children's home in Melbourne because his mother was alcoholic. And Tom recalls the cruelty of the matron of that home. For example, when he didn't eat his food, the matron tied him to the chair for two days. And when he wet himself, he was further punished and had to clean up himself. After another, on another occasion, he had an accident and fell unconscious and woke up on the kitchen table of the institution with the matron sewing the cut in his head with a domestic needle and thread. Given this medical neglect, it was therefore a real surprise to Tom as a child to be lined up in front of all the other children, in front of men with white coats who would administer injections that would blister his skin and cause so much pain. In November 2009, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Melbourne issued a statement of regret for the previous role of university researchers in using children as orphanages for subjects of medical tests. These children were used to test vaccines of influenza, whooping cough and polio. Several of these vaccines have since been shown to be carcinogenic. Tom today wants the laboratories that conducted those tests to be put on trial. Tom today wonders if he's going to fall victim to cancer. Tom today lives each day waiting for justice. This is Sandra. It's not her real name. Sandra refuses to use her birth name because it's a name that is associated with so much pain. Sandra's father died when she was two years old, and for some reason her mother then spent months away from the family home, leaving Marilyn, aged 16, the eldest, to look after seven children on her own. Marilyn had had a baby herself that died at six months old. Marilyn used to hit Sandra. And so when Sandra was 10, she was taken to Tufnell Home in Brisbane. From there, she was taken to the Good Shepherd Sisters Convent, where she was forced to slave in their commercial laundry. Sandra said to me, life was terrible in that laundry, and I was missing my other sister Lorraine. My heart was broken. So Sandra ran away from that laundry. After she was caught, she was locked up in solitary confinement for over a month at the Ipswich Hospital from the insane. From there, she was taken to Wollstone Park Hospital, an adult mental health facility. Sandra did not have a mental illness, and a report written at the time, which I have read, noted that her IQ was well above average, 
and that it was recommended that she be sent to school in accordance with her wishes. Instead, she was locked in an adult ward for the criminally insane, where she was forced to take the drug Peraldehyde, a drug so strong it had to be administered in glass vials because it melted plastic. Worse still, several of the male staff raped and tortured Sandra. Sandra's arms still bear the scars of the cigarette burns from that torture. I don't have a current photo of Sandra to show you, because now when her friends send her photographs of her, she rips them up because she can't bear to look at herself. This is Wilma. At the age of five, Wilma was taken to Dalmar Children's Home because her mother was ill with cancer. From there, Wilma was taken to Ormond House, a home for so-called juvenile delinquents. Wilma ran away from Ormond and slept in a phone box in Villawood, where she was found by a gang of bikies and raped. She was picked up and taken to Parramatta Girls Training School, where she endured the obligatory examination to determine the status of her virginity. Wilma learnt about shame and didn't speak about the rapes until she was 57 years old. Parramatta Girls Training School was a prison where girls were stripped of their liberty, their dignity, force-fed antipsychotic drugs and were targets of criminal assault by staff. Parramatta Girls were also threatened with incarceration at the infamous Hay Institution for Girls, and this is a photograph of Hay taken in 1965 by the New South Wales then Child Welfare Department, showing the prison yard and watchtower. Girls at Hay were not allowed to speak without permission, subjected to harsh labour, no education, and were not allowed to establish eye contact with anyone ever. Wilma today is a member of the steering committee of a national advocacy organisation for forgotten Australians. She's working on a proposal. She's working on a proposal with the Australian Bureau of Statistics in the hope that there will be a question about forgotten Australians included in the 2016 census so that appropriate data can be collected and targeted policies created. Wilma is also campaigning for a national memorial to be established in Canberra for forgotten Australians. And Wilma is here with us today. We need to acknowledge forgotten Australians. We need a public narrative that honours those who have overcome emotional and physical scars to participate in a society that abandoned them as children. And we need a public narrative that will help steer a swift course to justice. And so, if you're a lawyer, an academic, a journalist, or if you're a policymaker, a public servant or politician, if you're a teacher, a health professional, a social worker, if you're a producer, a curator, a festival director, when that request comes across your desk from a forgotten Australian or a care lever or associated advocacy organisation asking you to do something, and I can guarantee you that you'll get a request sometime in your working life, you will, because there are so many forgotten Australians and there is so much work that needs to be done. When you receive that request, what are you going to do about it? You may have recognised the voice of the narrator of the film that I showed at the beginning. The actor who narrated that film has been admitted as an officer in the Order of Australia, and he has worked tirelessly in the hope that the true stories of this country be told. The actor who narrated that film about children and institutions is Jack Thompson. Jack was one of those children. Imagine the burden of shame that will be lifted from the soul of this country when we acknowledge the forgotten Australians. <laughs> 